So uh, I wanted to tell you uh, mainly about work uh, done a couple of years ago with uh, Stefan Hollins that has to do with black hole stability. There's a, a little bit more recent work and, and a little bit of even more recent work uh, that I haven't referenced here that I'll allude to at the end, but almost everything that I'm talking about is in these, uh, today is in these papers. So I think for this audience, I probably don't have to do a lot of motivation about uh, studying stability of black holes, uh, maybe a little for black brains, but in ordinary four-dimensional general relativity, black holes are believed to be the end products of gravitational collapse, and also in four dimensions, the unique stationary black hole solutions are the Kerr metrics, so it's without question of very considerable both physical and astrophysical importance to know if the Kerr black holes are stable. And that has become, again, a, a quite active uh, area of research. Now, in higher dimensional space times, I mean, I, I don't think there's uh, that much of a physical and certainly not a, there, I, no astrophysical kind of motivation, but nevertheless, Black holes are certainly interesting playgrounds for various ideas, both in general relativity and also in other areas like string theory. I mean, in particular, one could ask if cosmic censorship holds in higher dimensions. There's some you know, issues there that uh, might arise that don't arise in four dimensions. Uh, unlike the four-dimensional case, there are a lot of black hole solutions in higher dimensions, and really for this Playgrounds reason more than direct physics and astrophysics is certainly of interest to determine their stability. Uh, it's also interesting to consider so-called black brain solutions and consider their stability. I mean, and there's a lot of discussion of them in the literature. Now, in the case of vacuum general relativity with a vanishing cosmological constant, it's very simple as to what a black brain solution is, if I take a black hole solution and add on some flat Riemannian uh, extra dimensions, possibly circles, possibly lines, uh, that's what I mean by a black uh, brain solution. And again, these have been the Schwarzschild black string in particular has been considered a five-dimensional solution of Schwarzschild cross the reals has been considered and discussed for over 25 years, and it's uh, interesting to consider their properties and their stability in particular. So what I'll be showing you today is that one can define a quantity for perturbations, for linear perturbations, called the canonical energy. It's quadratic in the perturbations. And the positivity of this canonical energy for all perturbations is necessary and sufficient for linear stability but in rather weak senses, as I'll explain, if this quantity is positive, if, if it's non-negative, well, if it's non-negative, then it's actually positive definite on all relevant perturbations. But if it's non-negative, then one can straightforwardly see that one has mode stability, at least. There aren't any exponentially growing solutions. On the other hand, if it can be made negative uh, for a perturbation, uh, now, I, I should say that we're considering axisymmetric perturbations. Uh, you'll see why that restriction comes in, but I should say that very explicitly. Uh, and we're only considering axisymmetric perturbations in the stability analysis. If this can be made negative, uh, it, for rotating black holes at least, for static ones, there's no restriction, uh, then we have instability at least in the sense that the perturbation can't approach a stationary perturbation at lay times in a sufficiently strong sense. And actually, if it can be made negative on a perturbation that can be written as the time derivative of another perturbation, then we can get a much stronger result. That's recent work, which I'll mention at the end. Namely, then the perturbation must grow exponentially in time. Now, these results are certainly much weaker than what one would like to prove, and I don't think one can do a lot better with these uh, techniques. One certainly might be able to improve the mode stability, but uh, I don't really think one can do uh, a lot better. So one shouldn't view this as some uh, 
kind of uh, replacement for other existing techniques uh, or even an improvement over an existing techniques that are being used to apply to curve stability. It really is a supplement, some different ideas that are added to the mix. But this also can do a lot of interesting things. First of all, it, the ideas are completely generally applicable to any black hole, not just Kerr or uh, whatever. But I think the most interesting part of the work is that we also show that this criteria, the positivity of E, is equivalent to other things. Specifically, as I'll explain in a minute, it's equivalent to thermodynamic stability of black holes. So a corollary of the work is that dynamic and thermodynamic stability for black holes are always equivalent. And it's also equivalent to the satisfaction of uh, a local Penrose inequality that I'll uh, explain. And in fact, uh, well, using uh, particularly the thermodynamic stability results, uh, it gives a really simple, sufficient condition, as I'll explain, for instability of black brains. So one can show that the Schwarzschild black brain is unstable with a uh, totally trivial calculation. So in the rest of the talk and in the work that we did, we, uh, the reference that I gave at the beginning of the talk, we're restricting to vacuum general relativity in arbitrary uh, dimensions. Uh, and then the corresponding black brains associated with such uh, black holes. So we're restricting to vacuum general relativity, well, without a cosmological constant, I should say also. But the techniques all are completely general. They'd apply when you include matter fields. They'd apply, in fact, when you change the gravitational equations, as long as you keep them diffeomorphism covariant. And Many of the results would also generalize straightforwardly. The positivity of flux, one certainly would have to check. Uh, and they would generalize to other asymptotic conditions, like if you had a negative cosmological constant, asymptotically anti-de Sitter, and black holes in anti asymptotically anti-de Sitter space time instead of asymptotically flat space times. OK, so I'm going to now explain what I mean by thermodynamic stability, and I'll also uh, explain the local Penrose inequality, and then I'll show you what we did. And I think doing the thermodynamic stability is probably the most difficult part of the talk, so let's see if I can get through with this. Uh, okay, so now we're changing the subject totally from general relativity to, you know, if you, those of people who are not pure mathematicians and took some physics courses, or even in high school, uh, this should all be somewhat familiar. But the way things are formulated are, I think, often quite confusing. So let's first consider some finite system. Actually, a star would be a good example of the kind of thing that, I'm, uh, that I have in mind. But we don't need to be in general relativity or gravity. Uh, it could be a box or something. Uh, which has some time translation invariant dynamics. In that case, there'll be the energy will be conserved, and typically there'll be some other either parameters in the Hamiltonian or conserved quantities that will be conserved under dynamical evolution. But for typical systems, the remaining degrees of freedom will be effectively ergodic. Uh, one can introduce then a notion of entropy uh, in terms of the number of states or volume of phase space uh, of the states of a given value of these conserved quantities, state parameters, that in a sense macroscopically look like the uh, uh, state that you're, that you're uh, considering. A thermal equilibrium state, by definition, is a state that's an extremum of the entropy at fixed state parameters. Uh, and of course, then the entropy can be viewed, well, the entropy can be viewed as a function of the state parameters uh, for thermal equilibrium states, I should have said. Uh, if one now is at a thermal equilibrium state and perturbs it, well, if you 
sort of perturb it away from thermal equilibrium at a given state parameter, you don't change the entropy by definition. And if you change the state parameters, you can calculate the changes by the chain rule. Uh, and that gives rise to this first law of thermodynamics. Well, I've written it as energy as a function of entropy and state parameters, but uh, same idea. OK, so what is thermodynamic stability? Well, the, the entropy, by definition, is an extremum at thermal equilibrium. The thermal equilibrium state will be said to be stable if it's locally a maximum uh, at the given fixed state parameters. Uh, now, this, can, this is a very, entropy maximum is a very standard uh, definition, but this can be written in a much nicer way or much more useful way, this condition. So this is entropy is maximum at f exactly fixed state parameters, well, to all orders, although only second order is relevant. But if I take the first law and write this combination of quantities that uh, uh, is taken from the first law but putting second variations on here, okay, then this quantity being positive, if we fix the energy and other state parameters, is obviously equivalent to this. But this quantity is independent of the second order perturbation by the first law of thermodynamics. So this, the positivity of this quantity for all perturbations that fix E and Xi just to first order is uh, equivalent to the entropy being maximum, that is, thermodynamic stability. OK, so I was considering a finite system up till now, but now let's consider some homogeneous system, uh, again, whose uh, again, with the same sort of state parameters, except these would now be per unit volume type uh, 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 quantities. OK, so then we have exactly the same condition for, therm for thermodynamic stability of a thermal equilibrium state, except now there's actually no need to keep these quantities fixed to first order because of the homogeneity I can borrow some of this from one region and give it to the other region uh, and get a perturbation that keeps this fixed, although locally I'm changing these effectively. So there's an additional sufficient condition for in thermodynamic instability uh, if this Hessian matrix admits a positive eigenvalue, then I can find a way of decreasing uh, of increasing the entropy uh, to second order near the original configuration, and I have uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, instability. Now, if this doesn't look familiar, uh, or, what, uh, or if, this, if, uh, if, if you're trying to tie this up with physics, if you forget about the other state parameters, the positivity of this quantity here is equivalent to having uh, a negative heat capacity. So in particular, this is saying that any thermal equilibrium state that's homogeneous and has a negative heat capacity is thermodynamically uh, unstable. But for a finite system, that negative heat capacity does not imply any instability. And in fact, stars in Newtonian gravity have negative heat capacity. And uh, well, most of the, many of them are, are stable. OK, so why did I have this long excursion on uh, thermodynamic stability, well, the idea is that uh, both black holes and black brains, in fact, satisfy all laws of thermodynamics with this uh, sort of correspondence uh, here in terms of energy, well, area, and uh, the state parameters would correspond to the angular momenta and charges, though I'm considering the vacuum case uh, uh, here. So, if we just copy over this condition for thermodynamic stability, this is the condition uh, that we would expect for stability uh, as a necessary condition, well, necessary in 
presumably, well, certainly as a necessary condition for th and sufficient condition for thermodynamic stability, we'll worry about dynamic stability. I mean, this is, by definition, the condition for thermodynamic uh, uh, stability for all first-order perturbations that don't change the mass and angular momentum. So one of the things I'll show you is that this condition is equivalent to positivity of canonical energy, which, as I just argued, is the condition for dynamic, necessary and sufficient condition for dynamic stability. The reason black brains come into this picture, interestingly, is they are homogeneous systems. The homogeneity, you just need one translational symmetry will be fine to make things uh, work, and they, the black brains have this. So that would suggest, or that would, carrying over the analogy, if you look at this Hessian matrix, uh, if that has a positive eigenvalue, uh, the black hole should be, well, is thermodynamically unstable, and you might think that it's uh, therefore dynamically unstable. In fact, Gupta and Mitra effectively conjectured this in, in a slightly different context with charges and so on, uh, will prove that that is correct. So all you need to show instability of black brains is if in, in this, uh, if you have a family of them and this matrix admits a positive eigenvalue, the black brain is unstable. So in particular, if we take the, uh, well, let's look at the Schwarzschild black hole. That has a negative heat capacity by the fact that 32 pi is bigger than zero. Uh, but that doesn't tell you anything about stability of a black hole because we only look at perturbations that keep the mass and angular momentum, well, the mass fixed. So this isn't a perturbation that's relevant for the stability of black holes. But it is relevant to the stability of black brains here. Uh, that's the only entry in the matrix in this case, and the fact that 32 pi is bigger than zero implies that the Schwarzschild black string is unstable in the sense, of course, that I'm describing. If you, uh, if you perturb it in suitably in this uh, kind of way locally, uh, then it can't asymptote back to a stationary uh, solution. That's at least what we can prove. OK, let me briefly explain uh, the local Penrose inequality, uh, which for the people familiar with Penrose inequality, this will have a great deal of similarity, but it's kind of a linearized or second order version of that. But it applies to some arbitrary family of black holes, possibly in higher dimensions. So suppose we have some family of black holes. Of course, when we're in higher dimensions, there are independent rotation planes, so we may have many angular momenta. And let's uh, consider some member of that family, and we actually only will be able to consider in this work black holes with positive surface gravity, I mean, per stability of black holes with positive surface gravity, so let me assume that uh, here. And let's, uh, well, let's consider a perturbation of that uh, black hole. Now, if you look at the linearized Rechiduri equation, in fact, one can see from that that the event horizon and apparent horizon are going to coincide to first order. Uh, they won't coincide in general to second order, but if we're perturbing about the, if we're looking at a perturbation around the bifurcation surface of the original black hole with non vanishing surface gravity, that's an extremal surface in the background space time. So the areas of the event horizon and apparent horizon, even though they disagree, are going to agree to second order, which is nice, because now I don't have to be careful about distinguishing between area of apparent horizon and event horizon. And in fact, I can work with the apparent horizon to second order. Uh, and pretend it's the event horizon in, in terms of, it, of the area. OK, this uh, pointer is ab about to run out of steam, I think. But let's see uh, how much longer I can continue. OK, so uh, let's consider this perturbation. 
where, and that's how much we've changed the area of the event horizon or apparent horizon to second order. Let's this, let this quantity be the uh, uh, area of the event horizon of the corresponding black hole in this family that I started with that has the same mass and angular momenta as the perturbations. Okay, and suppose that the area of the event horizon um, initially to second order is bigger than uh, the area of the corresponding black hole. Okay, th there's then a sequence of inequalities that would be familiar to people, a remarkable sequence of inequalities that remarkably all run the same way that people would be familiar with who've seen the Penrose inequality before. Uh, that leads to a contradiction with the black hole settling down to a stationary final state because the area of the event horizon can only increase. The final mass of the black hole uh, can only decrease. Uh, if we look at axisymmetric perturbations, uh, again, a restriction that runs throughout this work, uh, the angular momentum will be conserved. Uh, and by the first law of black hole mechanics, the area is an increasing function of m. Uh, so putting those all together, you run into a contradiction. Uh, that is, if this were to hold, then the black hole could not settle down to a member of the family at, la uh, uh, at late uh, times. But there's no argument here that you'd have stability if that were to be the case. Okay, so I will be showing you that the positivity of canonical energy uh, implies that this local Penrose inequality is in fact necessary and sufficient for stability with respect to axisymmetric perturbations. So not only does it uh, confirm the instability, which one could argue uh, uh, as I just did, but it shows that, uh, that Conversely, if the inequality is satisfied appropriately, then you have stability. Okay, so what did we do? Uh, well, the computations are uh, remarkably simple, and you know the tools I think are remarkably powerful. Uh, well, as long as one keeps the formulas general and doesn't actually write out all the terms, because then then things start taking pages, but there's no need to write out all the terms. Everything that uh, we're gonna describe all stems from the fact that general relativity is derivable from a diffeomorphism covariant Lagrangian, everything I'm gonna show you uh, now. If you write down the Lagrangian of general relativity and take its first variation, you get something that in my notation looks like uh, what I've written here with this theta explicitly given by this uh, formula for the particular Lagrangian of general relativity. If this doesn't look familiar, it's because people almost always put the Lagrangian under an integral sign and call it an action and do the variation under the integral sign. And, well, they usually take the Lagrangian to be a scalar density too. It's much nicer to take it to be a D form. Uh, then, then you'd have a divergence term if you took it to be a scalar density. It's an exact term here. Under the integral sign, you get some boundary terms when you throw the derivatives off the varied field, which you normally throw away. And what you're left with is the equations of motion times the varied field. Uh, for what I'm interested in, I'm going to throw away the equations of motion. I don't actually care at all for this work what the form is. But this boundary term is the thing that I'm interested in and want to keep. And this is the boundary term. Of course, the boundary term has some non-uniqueness. You could add an exact form to that. This is something locally constructed out of the background metric and the first order variation. But you know, we can keep track of all the ambiguities and they don't affect any of the final results. So you, I'm just mentioning that so you need not worry about it. Okay, from this boundary term, well, the boundary term can be viewed as a symplectic potential. It's kind of a P delta Q kind of uh, term. And if you take a second order variation of this symplectic potential, that defines, well, it's not really the symplectic form. The symplectic form you get 
by integrating over a Cauchy surface. Uh, uh, but this is some symplectic current that you can construct out of a pair of perturbations. And this thing you can show is automatically conserved. G, D of it is 0 if these quantities satisfy the linearized perturbation equations. So yeah, here I have the symplectic form being obtained by integrating over a Cauchy surface. And this might look a little bit more familiar if I decompose all of these into 3 plus 1 variables. Uh, one can write the symplectic form in this uh, sort of dp wedge dq-ish uh, kind of way, where this is the usual definition of canonical momentum in terms of extrinsic curvature. Now, the key point about this Lagrangian, as I've already stated, is its diffeomorphism covariant. If we apply a diffeo to the Lagrangian, we get the same result as if we had taken the metric, applied a diffeomorphism to that, and computed the Lagrangian. That fact, and the fact that that's true for an arbitrary diffeomorphism, or infinitesimally is true for an arbitrary vector field, uh, makes it very useful to introduce this notion of another current, which is just the symplectic potential that you obtain here in the, as the boundary term in the equations of motion, evaluated for a perturbation that is a gauge symmetry, uh, Li x of g. And then you have to subtract off x dotted into the uh, Lagrangian. So this is some you know, d minus 1 form. Uh, and it's easy to see that this will be conserved. d of this will be 0 when the equations of motion are satisfied. OK, one of the few things that takes a little bit of work in arguing is that this another current can always be written in the form of x with no derivatives on x dotted into something, which I'll explain later uh, in, a, in a second, plus d of something. And all these quantities are locally constructed out of x and the background metric and their derivatives. Furthermore, this C vanishes when the equations of motion hold, and it satisfies a sort of Bianchi, or it, it, it's involved in the satisfaction of a sort of Bianchi identity. So for those reasons, the C deserves to be called the constraints of the theory. And in fact, for general relativity, these are the ordinary constraints. I mean, Hamiltonian or momentum constraints, depending on what you choose for x. Uh, dotted into that. This Q is another charge, and the fact that when the equations of motion hold, well, the J is dQ, that's actually an even stronger statement than that the J is conserved. Okay, so now a quite simple computation gives rise to uh, what we call the fundamental variational identity. So I've written this equation down making no assumptions about g, x, delta g, or anything. The g need not be a solution of the equations of motion. The delta g need not be a solution of the linearized equations of motion. This identity holds. Basically, you can derive this in a couple of lines. I didn't write it out here. By considering the variation of the another current that I've uh, expressed and given, written here, and equating the two varied another currents given by this expression, well, they're the same another current, but the two formulas for the another current, equating the variation of this to the variation of this. Of course, for the variation of this, you can substitute that, uh, and, well, there's not actually all that much work to do, but when you've done that, you can, you end up with an anti-symmetrized second variation of the theta that gets replaced by this omega. So you get the omega uh, is something that is proportional to the equations of motion, which I'm going to take to be satisfied. So this term will go away. I'm just showing this in general. Uh, something proportional to the varied constraints, but I'm going to uh, assume that the perturbation satisfies the linearized equations of motion general generally, so these terms will be gone, plus an exact term, which is uh, of this form. Okay. 
So if we integrate this over the over a Cauchy surface, we get the symplectic product of some arbitrary perturbation with a gauge perturbation involving, well, if x were time-like, we could call this time translations, but I can, we can think of it that way for an arbitrary vector field. But Hamilton's equations of motion, I admittedly in a disguised form, and let me not try to take more time to explain it, Hamilton's equations of motion, well, you can kind of see it if you divide by uh, delta g, kind of, and make this a functional derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to delta g, and then multiply by the inverse symplectic form uh, on both sides. That'll tell you that the time derivative of g is given by the inverse symplectic form times the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian. This is a much more useful way of writing it. So what this says is that if a Hamiltonian conjugate to x exists, it need not. It, but if a Hamiltonian conjugate to x exists, uh, it's given by this formula. But this formula, well, provided that the background satisfies the equations of motion, of course. But uh, we have a, a formula for the omega here. And if you substitute that in, that tells you that the Hamiltonian, if it exists, is always a pure constraint form, volume integral of constraints. This is any diffeomorphism covariant theory plus a surface term. So if the constraints are satisfied, uh, then the value, so on shell, as people say, the value of the Hamiltonian will be purely a surface term. If we just have one boundary at infinity, this tells us that if we have a Hamiltonian conjugate to x, it'll be given by a surface term of this sort. And one can, if you choose x to be an asymptotic time translation, you can see the ADM mass works for this. And if x is an asymptotic rotation, the, asymp the ADM, which is actually equal to the Komar, Angle momentum will agree for this. So you can use this to motivate the definitions of conserved quantities in general relativity or any other uh, uh, diffeomorphism covariant theory of gravity. One of the main applications of that uh, formula it would be to consider now a stationary black hole and choose x to be the horizon killing field, which is at infinity given by some linear combination of time translations and rotations, if you now integrate this fundamental identity, so we go back to this formula, integrate it, well, this term is 0 because x is a killing field. These are 0 because of the equations of motion. So we just get boundary terms from infinity and the horizon. But the boundary terms at infinity are just the conserved quantities that have been defined. So we just have to evaluate this on the horizon. If we evaluate it on a bifurcation surface, the x is 0. And we just have to evaluate the another charge to figure out what's going on. And that turns out to be surface gravity times varied area. And that gives rise to this first law of black hole mechanics that I already uh, alluded to. OK, now getting more specifically to our work, right? we're considering stationary black holes uh, with positive surface gravity. So they have this bifurcate type uh, horizon. And we're considering now some arbitrary perturbations. It's actually critically important for our ultimate definitions to be gauge invariant and therefore meaningful to impose some gauge conditions. And I don't know how to see this except by going through the detailed calculations. So this is one case where one needs to look at what happens to uh, quantities when you make gauge transformations to them. The, the conditions turn out to be, well, one of them turns out to be very nice and natural. Uh, namely, we want, we, and both of these can be imposed purely by diffeomorphism. So there's no loss of generality. These are truly just gauge conditions. So one is we want to uh, uh, make sure that the location of the horizon doesn't change under the perturbation. 
So we require that the varied expansion at the bifurcation surface vanish. And for reasons I don't have any, I mean, that's incredibly natural. For reasons I don't have any great intuition on, we also need to impose that the varied volume element uh, on B, so this is just a surface condition, uh, is proportional to the background volume element. Again, that can be easily imposed by a gauge condition. Okay, so I just want to say that in case that comes up, but I, we won't need that particularly, but it's important that, you know, uh, you know, in order that I not say some things that are wrong when I say canonical energy is gauge invariant, that it's gauge invariant when those particular gauge conditions are imposed. Okay, so now here's finally the definition of canonical energy. It's just the symplectic product of a perturbation with its time derivative. And now one of the main things that we uh, are getting out of this uh, really follows without a lot of work uh, from this, by taking a second variation of this fundamental identity, you can kind of see that if I take a second variation because the x is a killing field of the background, it's only the varied metric that's going to uh, come in here, but that's going to give me the canonical energy. Well, there's a little awkwardness because uh, we happen to have defined canonical energy with respect to the time-like killing field, and this is the horizon killing field, but it doesn't make any difference if we can restrict to axisymmetric perturbations as we're going to need to anyway. Uh, so when we take a second variation of that fundamental identity, we get the canonical energy on the left side, and it's not hard to see that that's what you get on the right side, the same sort of combination of things that come into the first law of black hole mechanics, but now with second order uh, variations. So in fact, well, one can establish the, the following properties of canonical energy. Uh, and for that, it's convenient to, to actually view this as a quadratic form rather than a quantity just defined for a single perturbation. So as a quadratic form, uh, well, it's conserved. That is, it takes the same value on some other Cauchy surface uh, than the, perhaps the one you started on. Of course, that Cauchy surface will extend from this same bifurcation surface and be asymptotically flat at infinity. One thing that's quite easy to prove is that even though it's defined quite asymmetrically, uh, it's it's a symmetric uh, quadratic form. Then this is where our gauge conditions come in and uh, so on. If you restrict to perturbations that don't change the area of the black hole and you don't change the linear momentum, now this is really a gauge condition because by a Lorentz boost, because the mass of the background black hole is non-zero, uh, you could uh, always, <coughs> excuse me, make the momentum zero, but uh, anyway, e even though there's a gauge condition, we need to impose it. Then E is gauge invariant. Uh, okay, and then finally and most importantly, if we restrict to perturbations, we want to restrict to this anyway, uh, uh, but if we restrict to perturbations that also have vanishing change of mass and change in angular momentum, and by the first law of black hole mechanics, that implies they have vanishing change of area, which we would have wanted to impose anyway, then this E is non-degenerate on this space if and only if, uh, well, so here's our perturbation that's degenerate. Uh, that the E is degenerate on gamma is what I'm saying, if and only if gamma is a perturbation towards some other stationary and axisymmetric black hole. Now, in four dimensions in the Kerr case, if we, there aren't any other per stationary axisymmetric black holes with zero mass and angular momentum change, but in higher dimensions there can be. Uh, and 
the canonical energy will be degenerate <laughs> on those perturbations, but on this space, that's the only perturbations on which it's degenerate. Okay, and that non-degeneracy, well, immediately gives us some uh, uh, results, uh, 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 namely, again, restricting to this uh, space where, where the E is non-degenerate, then either the E, <clears throat> there are two possible cases. E is positive definite, or E is, uh, uh, or there's some perturbation such that the canonical energy can be made strictly negative. So if A holds, we easily have mode stability because we have a positive definite conserved quantity. That's incompatible with some exponential growth uh, in the perturbation. So that's easy. What about the other case? Well, th there's one more element to this work, which is to look at the flux of canonical energy through both null infinity and the horizon. And here's where the uh, axisymmetry uh, really comes into play. We couldn't get any result like this without axisymmetry. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, one can compute the flux of canonical energy. It's just given by this integral of the symplectic current and so on through null infinity and through the horizon. Through null infinity, it's given by just the perturbed bondi news squared plus another surface term, but that surface term vanishes uh, in the, if the black hole is, or if the space-time is stationary or whatever, and similarly through the horizon, the flux of canonical energy turns out just to be proportional to the perturbed shear squared uh, of the horizon, plus another surface term that also goes to zero. Uh, well, I guess the surface term goes to zero when the news is zero and when the perturbed shear uh, is zero. So the point is, if you had a perturbation where the news and the shear were going to zero at late times, that is, the black hole were settling down to some stationary final state, then the flux of canonical energy is positive definite, well, or the canonical energy that you get remaining on a slice that goes between the horizon and null infinity at these later time cross sections, uh, that is negative. So if it starts out negative, it can only get more negative. But if it had settled down to a, if it approached a stationary solution, the canonical energy is zero because I just said canonical energy is <coughs> degenerate precisely on the solutions that are to other perturbed, uh, uh, that are perturbations to other stationary uh, and axisymmetric black holes of the same mass and angular momentum. So that gives the result that in case B, where the canonical energy can be made negative, in fact, a perturbation can't asymptotically approach a stationary perturbation. OK, so now what is the situation with black brains? Let me explain this uh, at least very briefly. So. Uh, Suppose that within a black hole family, by changing mass and angular momentum, we can make the canonical energy negative. Uh, for example, for Schwarzschild, the change of mass perturbation makes that perturbation has negative canonical energy. As explained, that's irrelevant for the stability of Schwarzschild. But now, suppose we consider a Schwarzschild black string or more generally, any black brain <coughs> for which this holds for the black hole. Well, just briefly, we can consider a perturbation, we can consider the black hole perturbation, the change of mass perturbation for the Schwarzschild black string, and just multiply it by e to the i kz, where this is the x coordinate of the extra dimension. And we can choose k to be really small. In which case, the calculation of the canonical energy is essentially unaffected and will still be zero for this perturbation. 
except for one big catch, multiplying the perturbation by this doesn't satisfy the constraints. However, with some work, one can show that you can modify the initial data uh, so that it now satisfies the constraints, but without affecting or completely controlling the effect on canonical energy. But the perturbation with this behavior, if you include a whole wavelength, uh, <clears throat> has zero change in mass and angular momentum, et cetera, uh, and thereby is a perturbation relevant for this uh, analysis, and that's what gives uh, the, the black hole stability. Okay, for the local Penrose inequality, uh, well, since I'm running low on time and it uh, would take a little time to go through this, uh, if you had a one parameter family that violated this local Penrose inequality, I think all I really need to say is if you look at the difference between the second order areas or whatever, because these families have the same mass and angular momentum, all of that will, those terms will sort of cancel in the formula for canonical energy in terms of second order area change and second order mass and angular momentum change. And you'll just get the canonical energy difference of the perturbation that you're interested in subtracted off from the perturbation to the corresponding stationary and axisymmetric black hole. And further manipulation shows that that's the canonical energy of the difference of these perturbations. This is, well, this term goes to zero essentially by the same degener a generalization of the degeneracy result now, now the gamma bar is a perturbation that does change the mass and angular momentum, so, but this term is nevertheless zero. So that shows that if you can find a perturbation that doesn't change the mass and angular momentum uh, to first order, uh, it will, that has negative canonical energy, then you can violate the local Penrose inequality and vice versa. Okay, so uh, has this taken care of everything more or less for linear stability theory of black holes? Uh, well, to say the least, you know, not quite. Uh, one of the problems that I have not emphasized is that the E is given by a pretty darn complicated formula. So even if uh, you had the strongest possible stability results, given by positivity of E, it's not that easy to determine whether E is positive. I'll show you that in, in a minute. And of course, the stability and instability, well, I'll explain a much stronger, or say a few words about a much stronger instability result in a second. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, these results are certainly weaker than, significantly weaker than one would like. And fundamentally, we're stuck treating axisymmetric perturbations because a key uh, idea in this, or the, a key component of the argument, is this flux uh, uh, formula. And now, the thing is, this flux formula works at null infinity using the time-like killing field. This flux formula works at the horizon using the horizon killing field. But no formula works using a single killing field, which you need to have. That's evaded in the axisymmetric case because the time-like and, axi uh, time -like and horizon killing fields are effect effectively equivalent in that case. So you get this flux formula for either one in that case. But if you considered non-axisymmetric perturbations, there's no killing field that gives you positive uh, fluxes. So that's another restriction. So now, if you, it wasn't clear from my words about this being rather complicated, here is the formula for E in the form that I think is most useful in terms of perturbed initial data. So the Q is the perturbed metric perturbation, the pi is the perturbed momentum perturbation, uh, the D is the derivative operator of the background spatial metric. 
That's the first page of the formula. This is the rest uh, of the formula here. So it's not, and it includes a surface term from the bifurcation surface as well. Now, it wouldn't be so bad, I think, if it was just this, but the point is that the formula is only relevant for q's and pi's that satisfy the linearized constraints. So that makes it a lot more difficult to determine positivity. Uh, and of course, the total expression is gauge invariant, but you know, the local formula, you know, the value of the integrand at a point is very gauge dependent. Uh, and one probably will have to choose some clever gauges to, to uh, get positivity. But uh, there are a few further developments and some improvement of, in the situation of what I just said, which is that it actually, if you're perturbing off stationary and axisymmetric black holes, they will have, the background black hole will have a symmetry under T phi reflections. And you can then naturally break up the canonical energy into two parts, uh, the part arising from the part of the metric perturbation that is uh, T phi odd, which is naturally called the kinetic energy and is given by a much simpler portion of this expression. I haven't written it out. And the remaining terms, which come from the T phi even part, uh, would naturally be called the potential energy. So Kardec Prebu and I have relatively recently proven that the kinetic energy is always positive. That's for any perturbation of any black hole or black brain. So the problem is all in the potential energy, but that's given by the relatively complicated expression. However, because of the relationship of the kinetic and potential energies to the Hamiltonian, which is the usual relationship, we can show that at least using this positivity of the kinetic energy, that if you had a perturbation that was of the form of the time derivative of some other perturbation, and the potential energy was negative for such a perturbation, then this perturbation will have to grow exponentially in time. So that is a, certainly a strengthening of the instability result. Another thing, well, which is a paper being written or nearly written now, uh, 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 which is really a, a fairly straightforward generalization, but it, it's completely straightforward to generalize our results to allow a negative cosmological constant and consider black holes in asymptotically anti de Sitter space times. But a nice thing happens here in that there's no flux of anything through infinity in this space time. There's only a flux through the horizon and therefore, there's no need to restrict to axisymmetric perturbations. One can work with the horizon killing field. And using that fact, uh, one can show, and we have shown, that any such black hole in asymptotically anti de Sitter space times that contains an ergo region, which here is now defined not as a region where the time like killing field becomes, at infinity, becomes space like, there may not even be such a killing field, but a region where the horizon killing field becomes space-like, which would normally occur near infinity, any such black hole by these arguments would have to be unstable. Okay, so let me, so I'm done. Let me just state though that what I think is really the, you know, most interesting, at least to me, part of the work, which is uh, that dynamical stability of a black hole has been seen to be equivalent in the sense that I've uh, described, at least for axisymmetric perturbations, to thermodynamic stability. There's already an incredibly remarkable relationship between laws of black hole physics and laws of thermodynamics, and it's interesting that this also ex extends to stability. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, questions or comments? Q1s, Q2s, well, uh, I, I'm now evaluating the canonical energy 
for the same perturbation twice. So I've set 1 equals 2. So if 1 is not but, 2, it's a lot worse. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I mean, one could write this expression with appropriate Q1s and Q2s here or something. I've now just evaluated it for the same perturbation. If you're viewing it as a quadratic form, I've stuck the same perturbation twice into that quadratic form. And it is indeed quadratic. I mean, it can have q, q terms. It can have pi, pi terms. And if I find them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, pi is the, uh, sorry, I think I've gotten things confused. Pi is the background momentum. P is the perturbation. So it can have p, p terms, which it does. And if I can find them here, they'll be also p, q terms. But, you know, I could have put a 1 and a 2 on the different Qs as well. That would have made it look a little more complicated. Yeah, no, the black rings are black holes, according to this. So yeah, but everything applies without change to that. Yeah, right. And, and if the, the, those space times had an ergo region, the last result, I just said, will show that they're unstable. The, the examples you mentioned were vacuum space times. If you, yeah. if you include matter, can you comment about the role of matter? Yeah, there's not, I mean, I mean, the trouble is that matter fields tend to, you know, the ones you want to consider, you know, electromagnetism has gauge issues and, you know, uh, uh, if itself that you should really treat everything together with a big gauge group or something. But basically to zero the order, if we have matter fields, we're just talking about adding some extra tensor fields here in the Lagrangian. That will just add to the theta terms and the omega terms, et cetera. But it really doesn't change you know, it doesn't change these formulas. It doesn't, uh, you know, I mean, it just adds terms to these identities. So this kind of stuff, you know, including first law black hole mechanics, I mean, there may be for electromagnetism some extra potential change of charge terms will occur. So it doesn't really change that. What, you know, what it could change uh, is the flux formulas. Now, if we consider matter with positive fluxes, you know, like electromagnetism or scalar field, it shouldn't make any change there either and everything should just go over. But if you were to consider matter that didn't have positive energy or whatever, you know, if the matter didn't satisfy energy conditions, uh, bets would be off. Uh, uh, but, you know, the trouble is that each case, you know, has a few subtleties typically and you know one so I don't want to just make a blanket statement that it holds exactly in this form for matter but my you know depending on what form of matter you choose I may be able to say that or you know if you have fluids there are definitely some major subtleties with the trivial perturbations that add extra degeneracies I mean we've looked at that so I don't want to make blanket statements but you know, if I did want to make blanket statements, I would say everything holds for matter equally well. <laughs> okay, so, thank you very much, uh, Bob.